Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're so glad to have you here for this panel. My name is Nadine Fareed Johnson, and I am the policy director for the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University. And I am delighted to introduce today's panelists. Jess Myers is senior counsel at Chamber of Progress. She focuses primarily on the intersection of law and the internet. She is widely considered an expert on US intermediary liability law and has written, spoken, and taught extensively about topics such as speech in Section 230, content moderation, intellectual property, and cybercrime. Just joined Chamber of Progress from Google, where she was a senior government affairs and public policy analyst. She is a former software engineer who earned her bachelor's degree from George Mason University and her JD from Santa Clara University School of Law. Nicole Saad Brembridge is counsel at NetChoice and associate director of NetChoice's Litigation Center, where she focuses on NetChoice's litigation and amicus efforts. She specializes in reviewing federal and state legislation that affect the First Amendment, freedom of speech, Section 230, and AI. Before joining NetChoice, Saad Bembridge worked as a legal associate at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. She earned her law degree from Georgetown and holds a Bachelor of Arts degree, holds Bachelor of Arts degrees in economics and piano performance from the University of Washington in Seattle. Olivier Sylvain is a professor of law at Fordham University and a senior policy research fellow at Columbia University's Knight First Amendment Institute. I should tell you Olivier is here in his Fordham capacity. Um, his research is in information and communications law and policy with his most recent work focusing on online intermediary liability, commercial surveillance, artificial intelligence, network equality, and broadband localism. He was a senior advisor to the chair of the Federal Trade Commission from 2021 to 2023, and previously was a Karpatkin Fellow at the ACLU and a litigation associate at Jenner and Block here in DC. He holds a PhD from Columbia University, a law degree from Georgetown, and a BA from Williams College. Matt Wood is Vice President of Policy and General Counsel at Free Press, where he helps shape the policy team's effort to protect the open internet, prevent media concentration, promote affordable broadband deployment, and safeguard press freedom. Matt has served as an expert witness before Congress on multiple occasions. Before joining Free Press, he worked at the public interest law firm Media Access Project and in the communications practice groups of two private law firms in Washington, DC. Matt earned his BA in film studies from Columbia and his JD from Harvard Law. So we are in a period in which what are arguably the most important First Amendment internet cases in decades are before this report, which is why you're all in here today, right? We've seen this court's take on the First Amendment in recent cases such as 303 Creative and Counter Maybe Colorado, and I would imagine that all eyes in this room were on the court's decisions in Gonzales and, and Tomne last session. Now a pair of cases from the 5th and 11th circuits, Net Choice versus Paxton and Moody v. Net Choice, are set to be argued in two weeks. The question before the court is whether social media oversight laws promulgated in Texas and Florida, which prohibit social media platforms from censoring users' content via so-called must-carry provisions and impose stringent disclosure requirements, violate the First Amendment. So we're going to have to touch upon those cases and a number of other um, related issues today. I know we only have a little bit less than an hour, so we're going to try to get through as much as we can because I was talking earlier with the panelists. We think we could talk about any one of these smaller issues for an entire hour, but hopefully you'll get a nice overview about, the, about, what's, about what really was at stake here. So for all the panelists, I'm really going to start here with an end game question to help us set the stage for how each of you are thinking about the issues before the court. And then we'll work our way back into a few different avenues from there. So for each of you, take it any order you wish. How do you anticipate the justices will come down in the net choice cases? And how does that expectation differ, if at all, from what your ideal outcome would be? Matt, you want to start? Well, <laughs> Welcome. As the pinch hitter, I'm not sure I should be starting, but <laughs> thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. I'm not Gus Rossi, as you'll know, but uh, Matt Wood, handwritten. For you here, um, you know I don't know. I, I'm not enough of a Supreme Court watcher as as, as much of one as some people. So some people will say, "Here's exactly what this justice was thinking and what this one will." I, I think really Justice Thomas drives it. Maybe that's the least profound thing any of us could say up here today. But he has certainly been itching to take a look at these issues for some time. I, I think one of the things I want to talk about today, to the extent it's of interest, is not just the dry legal side of it, which is so important, but also the politics of it all. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we're sitting here in 2024 saying a conservative justice, whatever labels people like to put on these things, is somebody calling for more internet regulation and more regulation of what platforms can do is a, an interesting phenomenon. It's not where we were sitting 10 or 15 years ago. Obviously, these issues are very complex. They don't really fall neatly on right versus left lines. They're very much uh, dividing each of those sides, really. 
But, you know, I think that the Supreme Court will take some whack at it. I'm not sure, though. I wouldn't want to bet on upholding or striking down the laws just because I don't think the other justices' positions are well enough known on this for at least me to make a, a gamble at this. My ideal would be not to uphold these laws. We actually did not file in the Mitchell's case. We were in the Gonzalez and Tamda cases last year. Um, but that's not anything reflective of our views. We, we believe these are actually dangerous provisions. I'm sure we can talk about why that is. But, you know, I'm, I'm worried that Thomas will drive it, but I'm really not sure how the other votes will go. Sure. Um, so in the last 250 years, we've known uh, that the First Amendment constrains the government and protects private actors. Um, the founders specifically identified uh, with the press clause that the act of publication itself needs to be shielded from government interference um, in order to make sure that personal and political freedoms um, flourish. Florida and Texas, um, in defending their efforts to transfer private editorial judgment to the state um, in the name of free speech, is relying on a legal theory that uh, turns that really fundamental constitutional principle on its head. And I don't think the justices are going to find it persuasive. Um, just very recently in the last term, they reaffirmed, uh, in the context of online speech, no less, that uh, 303 Creative, that compelled speech, government speech compulsions, are just as constitutionally suspect as constitutional as uh, speech restrictions. And that's exactly what the Florida and Texas laws are, uh, speech compulsions. And I think that the court's pronouncement in 303, coupled with Miami Herald and uh, Reno v. ACLU, um, what the law requires is, is clear here, and I think as, as Knight and Chamber of Progress said, into uh, very different but equally apt briefs, um, you know, the, the Texas and Florida laws can't stand. Um, but, but to be sure, so Alito, uh, Thomas, and Gorsuch two years ago did dissent from the Supreme Court, allowing net choice in emergency stages to stop HB 20 from going into effect. But uh, they did so, firstly, before examining the, the full record. Secondly, before Justice Gorsuch himself um, wrote 303 Creative, which the other two joined. Um, and thirdly, before the court heard Gonzalez v. Google, which is where we really saw them in real time kind of come to terms with what social media platforms are doing when they're moderating content, they're exercising editorial discretion. So we're, we're very optimistic for a, a strong holding in favor of editorial freedom. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I was asked, the last time I was asked this question, it was about Gonzalez, and I got it wrong. So I'm a little hesitant to make predictions again. Um, I echo everything that the co-panelists have said so far. Um, I, you know, I think it really, it's going to depend. Are we going to apply the law? Are we going to play politics? I think it's very obvious, you know, Justice Thomas would love nothing more than to, to see uh, these internet companies uh, restrained in their ability to moderate content. Um, but I, I'm cautiously optimistic, uh, knock on wood. Um, I think based on what we saw in Gonzalez and Tamna specifically, I think the justices are, uh, I think they understand what's at stake when it comes to our you know, freedom of expression, when it comes to the way that these internet services function. And so I think that at least the first question with regards to whether uh, online companies have First Amendment rights to uh, engage in editorial discretion, I can see that, you know, going preferably well. Um, I think what I'm going to be part, what I'm going to be specifically uh, paying attention to is the question around the transparency provisions. I think the transparency discussion is a little bit less obvious of, uh, given the First Amendment concerns. Um, and I think, it, again, just given the, it, it wasn't heavily briefed um, by the amici as well. I think there was, there was one excellent brief by Professor Goldman who's in the room. Uh, but I, I still think that it's going to be uh, a, somewhat uh, obscure or, or vague for these justices to be able to connect those dots with regards to um, the uh, disclosures that are uh, required in the law. So we'll see. I'm not going to take any uh, certain stances this time around, but yeah. Um, well, it's going to be disappointing because we have agreement, I think, on what the court <laughs> is likely to do with regards to the First Amendment issues in, this, in these cases. Um, I, uh, I would be surprised if um, the court turned out differently. But you know, in the interest of mixing things up a little bit, um, I would like to observe that Justice Sotomayor, in dissent in the Halick case, raised questions about whether a private entity 
should be obliged to attend to public law norms, writing for a dissent that, and you can imagine in a world that joins Clarence Thomas and um, Alito and, and maybe Gorsuch. So I, I mean, I don't think that's where the court will go, but for what it's worth, there is, there is a logic in the air that is on both sides of the aisle. It raises questions about the, the gatekeeping power that companies have, which is of course what is animating the Florida and Texas laws. I also want to just put it out there, since no one has said it yet, um, that uh, to the extent this is a case about expressive activity, yes, it's a First Amendment case. But I hope the court doesn't lose sight of the fact that um, these are commercial enterprises, period. They are not, in my mind, speech platforms in the way that a lot of people like to believe. And if they are commercial enterprises, then they ought to be subject to commercial regulation. That doesn't mean that you can't regulate expressive activity by commercial Enterprises, that's what we've done in this country for a long time. But I hope we don't lose sight of that, and I worry that the court might. I'd love to see a careful opinion that thinks about the ways in which companies extract, exploit, use, cons use consumer information. Um, and, I, I, and, and, and Jess, I'm in complete agreement. I'm really curious to know where the court ends up with regards to the disclosure and transparency provisions in this law. I, I, I worry that they that they might undermine, speaking of um, government regulation of commercial enterprises, you know, laws that are addressed to disclosure and transparency generally in the interest of consumers. So I'd like to see the court uh, be careful about that. I appreciate you putting some intrigue into this. And, and we're, going, we're going to get into some of these questions here because there are nuances at stake. This is not, this, these are not easy questions at all. So Nicole, I'd like to turn to you because Florida and Texas place, place significant weight on the concept of common carriage as a basis for their efforts to regulate the platforms, and of course, NetChoice argues. Otherwise, I'd like to hear your perspective on that question. Why is this not a common carrier case in your view? And to explore a particular slice, you mentioned the editorial functions, editorial freedom. Is there an opening for the court to find the platforms to be common carriers for some part of their function? For example, with respect to the hosting function that's been, been promulgated by a number of, of academics, we, we, if we accept the idea that traditional common carrier rules do not automatically raise First Amendment concerns, if there is some kind of bifurcated, if you will, functionality approach that, com that comes to pass, would the platforms be able to carry out the editorial functions? Um, and what would their implications be, in your view, for speech online? Um, so to answer your first question, the net choice cases are not common carrier questions because they're about speech and the, the publication of speech, something the First Amendment um, prohibits government interference against twice over. Um, so to try to get around the First Amendment's constraints, we see Texas and Florida try to evoke a sort of um, expansion of, of a common carrier doctrine that's been um, applied to entities like meat packers and uh, ferries and freight carriers to impose forced hosting obligations on them. Um, but critically, none of those industries are um, traffic in the business of, of protected speech. And I think that is the really critical uh, d distinction here. Another thing that Texas and Florida are, are doing at the 11th hour is trying to position themselves before the court as these sort of civil rights warriors. Um, <clears throat> So they go as far as to analogize HB 20 and 7072 to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So the Texas and Florida laws would force platforms to host racist speech, and the Civil Rights Act of 64 prohibited delis from uh, denying service to, to people of color. And I just really don't think the court is going to be fooled by this conflation of the, the word um, discrimination, especially not Justice Kavanaugh, uh, who wrote uh, when he was a judge on the DC circuit, an opinion that specifically warned of the danger and even the absurdity of regulators trying to unilaterally uh, expand their authority by, by um, crying common carrier. Uh, indeed, as he said then, if Florida and Texas can seize control of, of private speech platforms because they suspect Silicon Valley ideology, what's next? California will take control over uh, Fox News, I don't know, Alabama, MSNBC, as one of our amici highlighted uh, publishers might be next, but book publishers. Um, with regard to the, the question about bifurcating the, their functions, 
look, it's important to remember that the act of, if we were to impose a must carry on the New York Times, like the act of publishing speech, if we were to impose that on that simple function, what we some refer to as the hosting function, it would be totally unthinkable. And the Supreme Court's been extremely clear. First Amendment protections don't differ uh, based on what medium the, the, the speech occurs on. Um, but were that kind of bifurcated version of a common carrier mandate to apply, I think what we would see is these popular speech platforms suddenly being flooded with the kind of stuff that you see on, on Kiwi Farms and um, 8chan. So NetChoice had a very broad array of amici from uh, uh, RSCOTUS to NAACP to CHOP um, explaining that, that that will happen and, and if it does, it will make the social media platforms unusable uh, for, for most. Thank you, I wanna pick up on, on the, the characterization you put about the states, um, the states' briefs invoking the civil rights, um, the civil rights theme, and mm -hmm. actually turn to Jess, because the Chamber of Com Progress, not Chamber of Commerce, excuse me, Chamber of Progress, <laughs> notes in its amicus brief that the Florida and Texas too laws, chambers. too many chambers, and then somehow not enough, um, will enable extreme ex extremist content to thrive at the expense of civil discourse and space for marginalized voices. And as Nicole notes, the state's brief do, briefs characterize the laws as, in part, an effort to defend against discrimination. They even invoke, as Nicole noted, civil rights themes to support this claim. So my question for you is, is there a universe in which the type of authority that the states are trying to impose actually supports protection of marginalized voices online? It's a great question. My answer is no, um, for several reasons. First, uh, I find it quite rich that the two states involved here have now shifted their arguments to talk about protecting marginalized voices when these are two states that have consistently um, uh, had efforts to, one, ban books on race-conscious decision-making, um, two, ban uh, books on, and information, access to information on LGBTQ plus resources, um, and three, force women to carry, uh, to labor over miscarriages to term. So I don't buy the arguments from Texas and Florida. Um, and again, their arguments sh uh, shifted quite drastically. Um, I think what, what's actually happening here is we're seeing, as, as Nicole was talking about, um, a com uh, we're seeing the, uh, the states conflate discrimination, right? At first, in the very when they were first briefing this issue, um, we talked about discrimination as um, uh, uh, pertaining to the message of the speech, the viewpoint of the speech, um, not who the speaker is. And I think that's that's obviously a, a very important um, uh, way to distinguish here. Um, now we're seeing these two concepts conflated. When we're talking about um, the internet services, for example, the internet services have content moderation policies because they are specifically moderating on the basis of the message, not on the person. Um, so again, uh, we're talking about uh, viewpoint and, and the content of the expression. Um, I completely agree with Nicole. This is about ensuring that heinous uh, speech remains online. And how do we know this? Well. Both Texas and Florida, when these laws came out, they championed the laws as uh, being laws to p push conservative ideology um, at, at the expense of, of sort of eliminating the Silicon Valley liberal approach to, to the internet. Let me call out a couple cases that we've seen in recent that um, are championed by the conservative right. It gives you a good idea as to the kind of content that they would like to keep up on the internet um, to ensure that we are, are boxing out and keeping out actual marginalized voices. You have Dilema v. YouTube, for example. Um, this was a case that a, uh, a, a reporter, a conservative reporter was suing over based on the fact that YouTube demonetized and removed videos of her pushing conspiracies against Jewish people. Um, the Federal Agency of News versus Facebook, another case this has to do with keeping Russian propaganda online. Uh, and then we have the Murphy and Wilson v. Twitter cases as well. Both in those cases, uh, one was about uh, misgendering and, and dead naming uh, trans folks online on Twitter. Uh, the other one was about being able to use LGBTQ plus slurs. Uh, in the LGBTQ plus slurs uh, case, uh, the plaintiff actually argued that he w was being discriminated against as a heterosexual male. Um, so that's the kind of content that we're going to, you know, that, that these states, I think, are hoping to see online. Let me be very clear about something, though. These services, you know, the reputable, legitimate ones, 
They're not going to allow LGBTQ plus slurs. They're not going to allow the kind of hate speech that you know we were kind of talking about earlier. Um, it's much. It, it's horrible for their brand. It's horrible for their users. The likely reality of, of of this is actually just going to be to remove content entirely, to to shut off all voices. And so to say that to to argue that this is all about ensuring that more voices are online and that the marginalized voices are the ones that stand out. That can't be the case if they're not able to speak in the first place or if they're driven entirely off the platform because it's unusable because it's become a cesspool. Nadine, can I jump into this please, conversation? Please. So um, I, I too am, am struck, what, what strikes me is, is, a, is a disingenuous invocation of um, the history of anti-discrimination law in the United States by um, the states here. Uh, and I agree there's a kind of conflation going on, but in the interest of mixing things up, I think um, that the language of discrimination that, apart from what the states are doing, um, that all kinds of people are concerned about sounds in competition law. That is, they're worried that these large companies are discriminating in, and that they're gatekeepers and making it hard for people to participate in conversation based on their own gatekeeping position. So that's, I, I just want to make sure we're, we're clear about that interest, because I do think we can get distracted by this, what is what to me is clearly disingenuous invocation um, at the last minute on this. And by the way, it, it's not uncommon for people in this space to invoke advocacy on behalf of marginalized groups to advance their claims, whether we're talking about 230 or the First Amendment. Um, so I tend to be skeptical about that generally. Um, so I just want to make that observation. Also, it, I think um, Jess and Nicole are right to the extent there are distinctions in the cases between entities that are compelled to say something that they don't want to say and the kinds of things that are issue in this case. So the FAIR case, for example, um, that's, the, that's the military recruiter case, mm -hmm. um, and Pruneyard, uh, which the conservatives like to invoke also. Um, this, that, those are not raised here, right? That's not imposition of speech on these companies. Um, but I didn't want, I want to make sure we don't lose sight of what is an interesting problem here, and that is the gatekeeping role these companies have. Right. Olivia, I'm going to stick with you, actually, because earlier you mentioned the commercial enterprise nature of, of the platforms, and you have written extensively and, and thoughtfully about the need for reform in the realm of platform reg regulation. You've also noted the court's narrow approach to examining platforms' interests, focusing on the fostering of expressive online engagement and discourse, mm -hmm. rather than, for example, the pecuniary or commercial interests. So do you believe that this approach that the courts have taken will affect their First Amendment thinking in the context of net choice? Um, and if so, to what end? And if not, how should the court be thinking about the platform's role, positioning, and power? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to change their view with regards to the First Amendment analysis. You know, um, you know, uh, you know, Justice Kavanaugh wrote the USTA opinion that I think you were invoking just um, wrote um, and wrote the Halick opinion. I think that's where the court is going to end up on these First Amendment questions. Um, what I hope, which is not just the First Amendment problem, is that, that, that the court is alert to the commercial endeavor that these companies are engaged in. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, this is a far more interesting question for me also in the context of the 230 debate, um, because it is that we ought to focus to the extent, the extent to which these companies are allowing the delivery of unlawful content, content that is actually dangerous and uh, against the law. Um, and we don't have sufficient protections for consumers in that instance, and to the contrary, the protections for the companies. I don't think the First Amendment is the vehicle for that. Um, I do think it is uh, 230 reform. Great, and we will actually get into a little bit of a policy discussion as, on this as well, um, in terms of if it's not via the courts, what other avenues do we have? So Matt, I'd like to turn to you. We, we've talked a little bit about the transparency rules at issue here that were set out by Florida and Texas um, in these statutes. What are your thoughts on the notice and appeal requirements up for review? Do you think they're overly burdensome? Do you think they represent maybe a workable approach for transparency, or would you see like a third, a third way? I mean, pro probably a third way, if I could take the e way out for every panelist. I, I, <laughs> I would agree with Olivia that we don't want to see a regime where you know, any kind of regulation of companies is out of bounds, meaning even when it touches things like this, with transparency about their policies, right? So I think we've seen this at the FTC somewhat successfully over the years. Tell us what you're doing, and then we're not going to say you can't do it. It's just really more about the transparency piece and whether or not the company is following the acceptable use policies it puts out there. Now, of course, that's very different than a law that says you must protect certain kinds of viewpoints. And you know, 
report on uh, what you're doing to take down content that the state has ruled to be protected or unlawful in different ways. So, I mean, I, I did not write a refund as I heard Professor Goldman did, and I, I don't know that others um, have, as, just, as uh, Nicole said, maybe the court is, hasn't gotten as much briefing on this as they need. This one does seem like more of a toss-up to me. Mm -hmm. I just want to go back, though, to the previous pieces, too, and, and just Please. note, for one thing, it's fun to be up here as a nonprofit group and have a uh, chamber of progress and that choice be even more fiery than I am, because usually that's supposed to be my role. But I completely agree <laughs> with the disingenuous nature of the claims being made that this is somehow protecting civil rights. I mean, that's why our group has been, as some might have noticed, walking this balance beam over, over time of saying we actually do want to have common carriage for certain kinds of communications platforms and not for others. And here we do actually see these companies moderating speech, taking things down. So I think you know what gets conflated here is not just people trying to falsely claim the mantle of civil rights law, but conflating the different kinds of non-discrimination law. And I always hesitate when I throw this out in the panel because this feels like multiple law review articles, but I would say there are at least three <laughs> kinds of non-discrimination law. There's common carriage, which we're talking about here in some respects. There's protected categories, right, civil rights law. And then there's antitrust, which is not discriminating against your competitors. And so that's where I think we get into trouble is when people want to mix those things up and then throw a dash of the First Amendment in and say, you're censoring. Well, no, that's only the government that can censor. So I mean, the transparency part, to try to get back to the question you gave me, is I think lesser than some of that, but that's that kind of overreach that we're afraid of seeing. Last thing I would say, too, just in response to Nicole talking about common carriage and speech, is we actually, of course, have had common carriage regimes applied to people who carry speech. Mm -hmm. And forget internet, right? Like, let's not even get to net neutrality. Let's talk about telephones. I think very few people would argue that telephones are not common carriers, to the extent we still have plain old telephone service. So, you know, there have been cases on that. There have been cases on must carry. There have been cases on the fairness doctrine. It's not that somehow common carriage is wholly inapplicable in the speech context. It's just that it has to be very carefully done. And I think that's exactly what these states have not done here. Um, but I think that you'll find in the case of the, the, the telephones, I guess, that that had to do with non-public trans... So the, it was not in the case of publishing, and there certainly was not the expressive yeah. act of content moderation that we see, you know, uh, sites as wildly different as, I don't know, Hunting Net, Christian Net, uh, Twitter, everybody... The, the act of curating an online community is expressive, and we don't see that in the context of telephones. So I do think this yeah. the speech kind of evocation is different. Yeah, to the extent it's not clear, I wholly agree. I think they're very different mm -hmm. services that are being offered. It's just that it's not completely out of bound to say, well, we want to look at carriage of speech in some contexts. It's just you know, here, it, when you do have, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but even under um, certain tests, common carriage is kind of a you know it when you see it um, test that's been put forward. I mean, there have been cases where the FCC has said, well, we're going to require you to be a common carrier, not just uh, base it on what you've held out to the public. But I mean, I do think that they're very different services, and that will not be satisfactory to everybody. But that's certainly our view. Well, I mean, the I, I do want to say, you know, I, I I offer these views because we want to complicate things a little bit here. The um, there are cases involving common carriers um, and the speech that is carried over them. Right? I think of the case of a network neutrality case from two decades ago involving AT and T's blocking of NARAL messages. Like, there is this does happen in the context of this infrastructure in, in, in terms of traditional common carrier infrastructure. So it's not completely different. Um, uh, but, but I do want to, I do, but I, I, I want to double down and agree that the kind of common carrier that we're describing that is not the sort of thing that I think the, the market, for, what I call the market for moderation looks like. Um, you have infrastructure, telephone is an infrastructure, granaries, that's infrastructure that has, that is essential for the function of a market. Um, I would not elevate these companies to that level. Um, these are commercial enterprises, pure and simple, and they compete in a market for, for viewer attention. That's different from what telephone infrastructure is. Before I change course, I want to offer any of you um, an opportunity to comment on the transparency rules if you wanted to bring that up before I switch off. All right. No? All right. Well, to be clear, yeah, the, the transparency provisions aren't exactly before the court. Um, it's only uh, provisions about individualized, like uh, explanations of why stuff was taken down. The transparency requirements that Professor Goldman has been leading the charge with wonderful uh, scholarship about Zotera and, and otherwise are not before the court right. this term. Yes, thank you. All right, so this is, this is another one for, for all of you. There are a number of other significant cases um, on the docket this term relating to platforms, including Murthy v. Missouri, the job owning case that arose from allegations that the Biden administration um, had pressured the platforms to remove certain content. 
How do you see the court addressing mirthing? And I'm asking you to put your predictive hats on, um, particularly given our discussion on net choice. And what relationship, if any, do you see between these cases? Um, so, so net choice filed an amicus brief in support of neither party in this case, along with uh, Chamber of Progress, our co-plaintiff CCIA, and the Cato Institute, because we believe that uh, proxy censorship is still censorship. Um, but I really think about the net choice cases and Murthy and also NRA v. Volo um, as two sides of the same coin. So both concern the permissible scope of government interference in, in private editorial decisions. Uh, one, the net choice cases, formal uh, government action, so legislation, uh, executive enforcement. And then uh, Murthy, it's like nudge, nudge, wink, wink, uh, threats or implied threats of adverse regulatory action. And I think that how the courts will, will find in these cases the rules that they um, issue will are kind of codependent. So, so if, on the one hand, the court finds for net choice that state efforts to commandeer private content moderation violate the First Amendment, but the government can continue kind of <sighs> going around whispering in platform's ears in kind of a coercive way to achieve what Florida and Texas um, want to do, whatever rule they issue in the net choice cases will be a hollow one. On the other hand, if the court finds against net choice that somehow uh, forced hosting under crippling civil penalty does not violate the First Amendment, it seems implausible to me um, that a tersely worded email could, could possibly violate the First Amendment. So I think that these are intertwined and what the online speech landscape after them will uh, really depends on, on the, the interaction between the two. We were really excited to see the court take the job owning cases with the net choice cases. Yeah, I think it's, I, I, I've been struggling with how the court is supposed to detangle. If the court decides that, okay, um, yes, there was uh, coercion here. The government can have no involvement whatsoever in content moderation. How can we have then state laws that then it, it involve themselves in the content moderation processes of these companies? So I think there, that dynamic is, is definitely at play. I have the same concerns that I have with regards to the transparency pieces. I'm, I'm concerned that there's going to be a lot of dots to connect for the court here. One big one being that, look, the government talks about content all the time. I mean, are all of these hearings that we're seeing these companies dragged into, or can that now be used against the companies whenever they make a decision that's either in, that's either favorable to what someone said at a hearing versus not favorable? Um, so I think you know, uh, and we made this very clear in our brief as well that you know wherever the court, whatever the court comes up with here, um, I think it's a, crucial that it remains the case that these internet companies are not considered state actors, that they're still considered private actors, private entities that have a First Amendment right to continue moderating, despite what, you know, Ted Cruz says on Twitter, or, you know, the, th the other threats that we've seen so far. The, the court does have an opportunity to be clear about the difference between coercion and persuasion in the doctrine to double down on an approach that it has adopted elsewhere. I think the night, you could probably talk about this, Nadine, the night brief talks about um, want, needing the clarity um, on that. Because, you know, governments are there, in, in the, the bully pulpit is a thing we, we honor because it is part of the democratic process, right? So presidents are elected because they can persuade and they are attentive to the concerns of the public. The Surgeon General um, can issue a report that expresses concerns about the ways in which social media are proliferating harmful data and information about public health. Um, how far does this go? Can um, governments, can the President, can the Surgeon General engage in conversation with people who's who are affecting um, consumers, absolutely. But we do need a, some clarity about what that line is, and that's what this case, I'm hopeful that's what this case sets out, an opportunity to make a distinction, a totality of the circumstances distinction between what is coercion and what isn't. And, and you know, this is also, as with um, many of the other, these other cases, an opportunity for the court to start thinking critically about what these companies do. Yeah, and I mean, I think I would agree with Olivia to some extent, too. There must be a difference between communication and coercion, I think. You know, if, if somebody puts out on some platform whatever power the government has to regulate that platform, election day is on a Wednesday this year, and the election board calls up and says, no, it's not, it's still on a Tuesday, 
I don't think that's coercion, but of course it's not just based on the substance of what's being communicated, it's based on the threat. So is there a threat? If you don't take this down, then bad things will happen to you. That's what we see former president and current candidate Trump saying he wants to do, is take things <laughs> to that level and say, if you say the thing I don't like, then we'll take away your license. But I think that just communicating that there's something false or at least something questionable on your platform does not rise to the level of coercion without more. I think the way these cases are connected, though, too, is that, I mean, it's, it's not just these cases. Obviously, it's the 230 regime as well. You have this funny uh, unification of the positions, right, where Biden and Trump both said, get rid of 230. And Democrats tend to think that if you get rid of these protections, more things will come down, more bad speech will come down. Republicans tend to think that if you get rid of these laws and just zap them out of existence, more speech will stay up. I, I usually say they can't both be right, but maybe they're both right to some extent because there would be more chaos and you'd have more of a mixed bag or you know, potentially even the same results we get today just with a, a different landscape. But just to finish here, I mean, I think the way these cases are connected is this is why it's so dangerous when you have the government <laughs> making these determinations about what must stay up. Because we all agree and have had to throughout the years, whether it's talking about net neutrality or now platforms, well, it, this doesn't protect unlawful content, right? And I mean, that, that's, I mean, some of the laws even speak to that. Um, but that's very dangerous when you have the government deciding what is lawful or unlawful, right? So Texas not only had the bills at issue here, but I think it was HB 2690. I was just trying to look it up. I'm not sure if I remember correctly. But in connection with their abortion uh, denial and, and abortion rights decisions, trying to criminalize communication of information about abortions from even, even from speakers outside of the state. So, you know, there, I think that really tests this bargain and this notion that somehow what we're doing here is just neutral if we're saying, well, don't discriminate based on viewpoint when the very same state is saying, we want to make it illegal to talk about certain topics. And once we, the state, have decided something is unlawful, well, then suddenly it falls out of this viewpoint protection because we get to decide those things. That's a really important point. And, and the politics of it are obviously um, at front and center. So I'd like to shift a little bit and talk about the fact that both the political left and the political right have taken a strong interest in platform regulation. And they, find it, they define it differently. They want to look at it from different angles. But, but it is there. And um, that's not only state level, but also in Congress. Last session, Senator Warner introduced the Safe Tech Act, um, which would have limited Section 230 immunity. Um, I'm sure many of you watched the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing last week, um, where tech CEOs were facing sharp questioning from both Democrats and Republicans, um, who sought to establish which companies would endorse bills that they had promulgated that, would, that were aimed at um, ostensibly improving child safety online. Um, so, Many of the groups have expressed a concern about those bills and about regulation more broadly from a First Amendment perspective. Um, I'm going to start with you, Olivier, but I'd love to hear from all of you. What do you see as the path forward for regulation? I think I want to disagree. I, I've, I've been happy that we've been in agreement mostly, but Matt, I, I want to push back on the observation you made about how um, uh, about, the, about the equilibrium politically. Um, the Safe Tech Act, the PACT Act, they articulate vision, a view, a compromise view between parties about how to attack this, even though attack the problem of content moderation, even though they come from different places. Um, and I don't want to understate that, right? So, so the PACT Act attempts a legislative settlement. Um, it has all these transparency provisions, um, for example, and it creates a, a regime for um, you know consumer appeal of moderation decisions. But it also gives law enforcement agents, civil law enforcement agencies, the ability to bring cases in a way that 230 would not allow it. And, and you know, and executive governments exist to enforce the law. Um, um, the, the Safe Tech Act carves out um, um, areas of law so that 230 is not a block, say, for a civil rights case against a company um, or a, a cyber stalking case or an antitrust case. Um, this is a legislative settlement between um, parties that are otherwise um, at odds because there is a concern about the impact these companies are having on our public lives and avoiding liability for unlawful content. That's what these laws are about, holding these companies accountable for unlaw trafficking and unlawful content. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll be the one to push back here a bit when we're talking about Section 230 just to start. So um, first of all, 
the majority of the Section 230 cases these days are actually not turning on Section 230. They're being thrown out very early or they're turning on other uh, matters of law. Um, and so, you know, if this was four years ago, I would I would say, yes, you know, we're having Section 230 has been very successful in staving off a lot of um, frivolous litigation. Today, that's really not the case. Obvious, you know, I also have to point out the obvious here that when we're talking about unlawful content. Um, Section 230 does have an exception for uh, unlawful, uh, for you know, exception for criminal, federal criminal prosecution as well. So when we're truly talking about unlawful activities, um, that isn't going to be a Section 230 question, anyways. So it makes me it, it, these calls for 230 reform. I always have to go back and ask, you know, uh, what do you expect? to solve, like what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Because if we get rid of Section 230, the First Amendment is still in play. I mean, the net choice mm -hmm. cases completely are centered on the First Amendment here. Um, we have other uh, questions of law at, at play. I, I question the um, I, I question the the regulatory strategy around Section 230 specifically, um, and then I'll also go back to the discussions that we were having with regards to common carriage regulation. I'll, I'll state strongly here: um, I don't think common carriage regulation makes sense for internet companies. Um, we said this in 1996, right, in the uh, Reno v. ACLU, the Supreme Court had said the internet is a wholly new medium of worldwide human communication. And there is a point to that. It's different from the telephone companies and from um, what we see as traditional common carriers, right? Like if you get kicked off of Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it these days, you can still find a community. You can still have a voice online. There are many facets of the internet where you can put up your own blog, you can join a community on Reddit. Um, your voice can still exist. So it's not like when we're talking about an internet access provider, for example, where um, they kick you off, that's it. And if that's the only access provider in your area, you're done. You're, you don't have access to the internet anymore. That's not the case here. So um, I don't think the path forward is, is 230 regulation. I, I don't think the path forward is common carriage. Um, I think, you know, again, we need to go back to the question of what problem is, are we actually trying to solve here? Because at the end of the day, I think the way that, you know, these different internet systems, uh, different internet companies exist, their different content moderation policies, their extensive transparency reports that they already put out. Um, I think what we'll find is sort of this already existent happy medium that is a reflection on us as a society. Um, and if we want to change the way that our society is operating, then we need to address those underlying problems with society, um, not the source of which we communicate about those problems. Can I answer the question of what is the problem we're trying to solve here? Um, the, problem, the, the problem we're trying to fix is um, the fact that there are companies that do not have to attend to their civic responsibility. Law engenders a sense of responsibility. That's, that's kind of a social contract concept. This is one area in which there is a protection from abiding by civic responsibility. Now, that's the bottom line concern. There are material harms that these cases that are percolating up aim to redress. Um, the companies invoke Section 230 in where the facts are, are horrible, right? And we don't even have to go that far. Um, the civil rights cases, the true civil rights allegations against, say, the ad manager of Facebook, something um, I've, I've written about and others have written about, underscores that these companies will invoke 230 or avoid litigating in a court for fear of what will happen if 230 is narrowed. That's what's at stake. Material harms and the responsibility to attend to civic responsibility. That's an obligation every company owes or ought to owe. I mean, and I'll respond as well to that. When, when we're talking, even the discrimination cases, right? So the Facebook HUD discrimination case, that didn't turn on Section 230. That was settled. Um, when we're talking right. about, again, so like when we're talking about uh, unlawful content, even, even today, right? Like let's take um, the Neville v. Snap case, right? A lot of these cases that are turning on um, discussions about fentanyl um, and access to that kind of information, right? These courts are not permitting a Section 230 defense anymore on those kinds of topics. So the the, the only pushback I have here is that to say that the, the solution here is to reform 230, we're kind of past that. These, the, at least with the, at least where, with where the courts are today, um, I, it it seems like sort of a moot discussion. I, I don't think it's moot um, uh, because there are so many aspects of the public law that have not been evaluated, have not been elaborated because Section 230 has been invoked. Finally, so the Gonzalez case is a really interesting case from last year. That's a Section 230 case. This has come up already. That's a case in which people allege that the social media companies. 
Um, that there are a couple of cases, right? But principally, the argument is that um, social media companies are allowing the distribution of terror content that promotes terrorism. So they're, you know, aiding and abetting terrorism. And the Supreme Court is asked to decide whether or not 230 shields companies from being held accountable for that. Um, as I just said, I think many of us didn't anticipate where, this, where that opinion would end up. What the court decided to do is, you know what, we can't figure out the 230 issue. Let's actually sort out the aiding and abetting question. Let's resolve it on that. I find that to be a, a promising turn. It suggests 230 is not an easy way out. Now we actually have to attend to the underlying potential harms. And I agree, in a lot of these cases, the social media companies, YouTube, should not be held accountable for aiding and abetting. But at least we get some law on this. We are not getting law on substantive public law because of Section 230 protection. I disagree with that. I disagree with that entirely. I mean, we again, the majority of these cases are turning without even having to evaluate Section 230. So like, let's take Gonzalez, for example. Yeah. Um, the speech at issue in Gonzalez is heinous, but it's not unlawful. So what do we do then? What is the, no, no, what is the public, what, what uh, recourse do we have for speech that is legal, that the companies are using their First Amendment rights to host and to moderate? What What's the recourse then? So Jess, you're getting ahead of it, in my view. So. You say it's not unlawful, the, the, that underlying conduct, the, the conduct issue, the material of... Um, the content, yeah. The, the material, of, the aiding and abetting, right? Um, and you say it's not unlawful. No, the content. The I, content I, is I, unlawful. I'm not addressing the aiding and abetting. I'm, I'm more addressing the content itself. And if we look at it, again, we're talking about in the United States, mm -hmm. that there is a lot of content that is legal speech. So, uh, you know, I, I, we looked at, uh, Professor Eric Goldman and I, we looked at like right. 60 plus cases a couple of years ago that, that looked at, that were speech-based, content-based cases. And the majority of them, again, turned on First Amendment or, you know, poor pleading issues at the beginning, et cetera. But my so, question to you is like, what issues does the current law not address? Well, so I, I mentioned, you mentioned the HUD case, which I'm, maybe we're talking too much over here. Oh, sorry. But, but, but I will just say, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm you mentioned the HUD case. Yeah. The HUD case was a case that Facebook desperately wanted to settle because they didn't want the 230 issue litigated. They invoked 230 in that case. So there are harms, material harms that are content-based unlawful speech acts. And my only point is 230 is a block to that. Vargas v. Facebook, the court threw out Section that they the Facebook invoked Section 230. The court threw it out. Yes. I, so we're having those discussions today. And that's, we're that's not having discussions. Actually, go ahead. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah. I mean, I I think, right. I mean, I, there's something compelling to say. Well, the law is supposed to be about engendering civic responsibility, as you said. But I mean, the question still is, to whom do you owe, owe a duty? Who owes that duty? Who can right. you go after for violating that? So. It's a very hard dance to do, but we've tried to do it to say, yes, when it is the platform's own action that is being called into question, then 230 should not be a bar. Obviously, that's going to be called into question when they're saying, well, we're just curating somebody else's unlawful content. You mentioned the PACT Act. I mean, we have not fully endorsed that because I think it hasn't really come back around again. But I'm actually intrigued by that notion of having courts decide when and where we can find that the platform has some knowledge of the harm it's causing. To say that there are some, I think I would call them good faith bipartisan attempts to find common ground does not mean that every bipartisan attempt is a good faith attempt. And so that's where I would stand is to say that you know, there have been some explorations of this. I think uh, Rep. Byer said earlier that he thinks that you know there are 190 AI bills in Congress right now and most of them are good. And I would probably flip that ratio and say probably most of them are bad because laws are not easy things to write. But the, you know, I mean, exactly. There's, there's a lot of, as Jessamyn was saying, a lot of ground we can cover under the existing law. And you know, it, again, it's it's just not it's not simple to say there ought to be somebody who's responsible for bad things happening because the question still is who and under what grounds. So I would characterize Google. I was a pinch hitter earlier. I'll switch to Super Bowl as a complete punt, <laughs> right? And to say no, we're not going to reach the 230 question here because they have failed to state a claim is I think the basic holding there. And so that might be unsatisfying to people too. But I think that's really what that turned on, not deciding that they ought to go past 230, but saying we're not even going to get as far as 230. They didn't want to do the the 230. Briefing was an argument was not perfect. <laughs> I put it that way. So I don't think they had a lot of clarity about what to do at 2:30. But they knew to turn to what you just said, Matt, and that is who owes a duty to whom. I think one of the biggest questions here right, is that accountability question. And actually, I had a question for you, Nicole, um, which is, let's assume for the moment the court declines to uphold the Florida and Texas statutes. From your perspective, what kind of action from Congress is there? Action from Congress that would be workable to address the concerns that do exist about platforms, about content that does continue to proliferate on those platforms. 
Yeah, so speaking of odious content that keeps flooding the internet, um, the Texas and Florida laws are really, must carry mandates like that is really what would uh, create that problem and under a crippling civil penalty at that. So hopefully we dodge that bullet, uh, court finds uh, in favor of editorial freedom. Um, but okay, regulatory landscape uh, after the um, net choice cases. So Congress would be, um, unable to take action against private content moderation, so so interfere in, in editorial judgments, force uh, removals or force um, content to be left up. But it's for the exact same reason that Congress isn't allowed to affect uh, book bans and Congress isn't allowed to make us all drive around with live free or die license plates. Um, I also want to address uh, an idea that you know, if net choice wins, then social media platforms are unregulatable, which I think Knight touched on a little bit in, in the brief. Um, I really don't think that's true. So what we're asking for the court to do is reaffirm that the First Amendment applies with full force to the internet. Um, antitrust, consumer protection, uh, certainly privacy, which net choice has been asking Congress for for about a decade. Uh, none of those are, are precluded under the the a, a favorable holding for net choice. What is precluded is um, privacy law or a content moderation law masquerading as a privacy law, which is what we see in states like California, which the um, with the Age Appropriate Design Code Act. Um, but if Congress is thinking about taking some action against um, online speech after the 23, 24 term, I think it should consider um, thinking about uh, passing a, a job owning statute. So um, Congress, uh, it's well within Congress's power to impose uh, liability on executive officials for seeking to, uh, to uh, browbeat in a constitutionally impermissible fashion social media companies to take certain editorial actions. I think a good bill um, would seek to impose that liability on government efforts to leave stuff up, which should be primarily the concern of the Democratic Party, at least in today's political climate, as well as efforts to get them to, to take, take stuff down. I think that would be a, a worthwhile effort they should consider. Great. So we have about five minutes left. I would like to allow for some questions. Um, and unless, unless anyone has one more, anything more to say about potentially meaningful oversight from your perspective, so we can open it up to the audience. All right, great. Thank you all so much. Um, hi, thanks everybody. Nice panel. I'm Max Helper from Reason Foundation. Um, I would just say a lot of things I've learned to have, but I, I, I just want to share with that, with that 230 and to a group of mainly First Amendment focused people that I think is helpful perspective. Um, it seems like there's a lot of agreement in this room, right, about the way this case should be. There's even a decent amount of agreement, more than normal, I might say, about how the Supreme Court will decide this case. I guess the question I have first is, does the other side of this case think it's really a possibility to get a big win for the Supreme Court and change these things? Or do they see this really as a piece of performance art that convinces their constituencies that the system is rigged against them. And if there's a distinction between those two things, is there a distinction between that and fight the case? Um, I mean, it's frankly seemed a bit performative to us from, from the start, from, from 2021. Um, there, Texas and Florida are writing two cases, Pruneyard and Fair, so hard, and I don't blame them because they've passed laws that are kind of impossible uh, to defend. Pruneyard is a wild aberration from the rest of the Supreme Court's compelled speech jurisprudence, and um, I, I really don't think the, the court is going to be uh, willing to extend it far beyond its facts to um, ex expressive platforms engaged like Whose, whose business is publishing and, and curating speech. I think it's implausible, and I'm not sure, I, I don't know what's in Texas and Florida's head, but it certainly seems implausible to us. That's implausible. Also, civilians have problems confusing Section 230 and other issues. So you should always err on the side of being really clear about that. 
Um, <clears throat> thanks. My name is Courtney Raj. I'm the director of the Center for Journalism and Liberty at Open Markets Institute. And could you talk a little bit about how do you reconcile kind of the hypocritical views of claiming publisher rights and equating Facebook, for example, with the New York Times, but also gaining, uh, you know, protections from the responsibility to moderate or for defamation, et cetera, that publishers like the New York Times do not have. So there's, you know, platforms, I think, to your sense, are certainly new in terms of the levels of protections and unprecedented, um, rest, you know, protections that they have from existing legal regimes. And then just second, you, you know, we're really talking about social media, but there's another, I think, really interesting online expression case, which has to do with OpenAI's case or New York Times case against OpenAI, which will have implications for generative AI and the expressiveness of that type of content and affects online expression because we're seeing now how people and organizations are deciding whether to make their content open or free or not. So could you address those two if there's time? Thanks. I'll take the first one, yeah. Yeah, it's excellent questions. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't find it, we have seen that argument uh, that you know the First Amendment, Section 230, they kind of uh, they they don't interchange uh, when you're talking about, for example, newspapers and and online companies. I don't actually see that argument. Um, I think the First Amendment says it, it's in, that these companies, private entities, have a right to editorial discretion. That's what the New York Times does. That's what the internet companies do when they are deciding to curate speech. Where Section 230 comes in is it, it really it's, a, it's an exceptional law that recognizes that while these internet companies are akin to our offline publishers, like newspapers, for example, they are also unique from offline publishers in really important ways. And the one really important way has to do with the control of that speech. So New York Times, for example, is never going to publish something that New York Times has not first vetted or um, has you know, put through their own editorial processes. That's different from Twitter or say a social media experience where you know I put something out there, there's not somebody on the other end of Twitter that's looking at my post before it goes out there that would break the entire uh, way in which the modern internet and social media work. So that's really, again, these services, they are like, they are akin to private publishers and the fact that they use editorial discretion, they make choices about what kinds of information they choose to host um, and that uh, you know algorithmically are promoted to specific users but they are also different in that regard when it comes to control because at the end of the day, the New York Times is just trying to um, uh, keep a control on the messages that they're putting out. It's the same for these other companies as well. Take again, look at what happened with Twitter and X, for example, you know, the message that X conveys is probably very different than the message that Twitter conveyed back in the day. Um, I just like to add, so uh, Senator Wyden and, um Chris Cox, the authors of Section 230, filed an amicus brief supporting net choice um, at the Supreme Court. And they explained that um, the passage of Section 230 reflected Congress's judgment that uh, editorial discretion is indeed a, a First Amendment activity. Um, and uh, they, they passed it so they would be able to exercise it without this sort of like heckler's veto that you get in the American system without loser pays uh, where, you know, powerful people would be suing online speech intermediaries every time there was something I, that was that was offensive to them. Um, I also want to say there's been, I think, some confusion among Texas and Florida's uh, amici saying stuff like the existence of 230 counsels against net choice and the net choice cases. I think that's a, mis a basic separation of powers misunderstanding because um, Congress cannot change the meaning of the Constitution with, with, with a statute. Um, so so I, I hope the, the court resolves that confusion in its opinion. Right, there is no power granted for Section 230. I think that gets missed often. Can so. I can I finish, can we, I know that you're wrapping up, but I just so that we get different point of view um, aired a little bit. Um, so um, I'm hopeful that the courts are attending to the way in which these companies design their services and operate in ways that are not what um, Representative Cox, Cox and Senator Wyden had in mind in 1996. Um, and that's why this is a problem for us. We have uh, evolution in the way in which commercial surveillance works and the ways in which companies collect and distribute information that was never seen before. It is no mistake that we are trying to revisit this, even if sometimes some states are invoking their own kind of performance art to get there. I know we're done, but I, I, I just don't see it as hypocritical because I mean, I, there's often this gotcha sense of 
aha, they could be treated as publishers without 230. And I'm like, yeah, that's why we need the law. So I think we've had yep. for the longest time this notion that online there are not no barriers, but there are lower barriers to speech. And that's a benefit to us, not every time, but oftentimes to have that kind of freedom that, as Jess said so well, you don't get from a newspaper. I think that's a perfect place to close. Thank you all so much. It's wonderful. <laughs>